Well, welcome everybody. I'm Catherine O'Regan, the Executive Director of Sydney Business Chamber, and pleased to uh, be the host of your forum today. Um, we've been doing a fair bit of these. I think I was counting almost 50 since we started doing things more in a digital capacity in March. Um, and we've covered so many different topics. Yesterday, I actually did something very different to today. It was on arts and culture, but we've done a lot around infrastructure and financing. Um, so it's a real uh, diversity of information to share with you and to really get a good discussion going. Before we kick off, I do want to um, acknowledge uh, that I'm standing on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and, um, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I also do want to thank um, Bill Berger, who are uh, our digital partners today. Um, I know that they've been pretty involved with a lot of things that we do do. Um, and John Kinsella, the Managing Director, I believe you're online just as much as Rick Graff, you and the team, I think, um, have all joined us today. So thank you very much. We've got a great audience today. And likewise, we have a great guest speaker. So David, I'm really pleased that you're here. Thank you, and I'm honoured to be here. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And it is really good to be talking about building and construction. Um, you know, I think we're hearing a lot from government get those projects going, whether they're residential projects, whether they're big infrastructure projects, just to get the economy back up and running. Um, but it is really interesting because pre-COVID, we, we were very focused on getting the quality there just as much as, you know, getting things done. And so it's um, going to be really interesting, I know, from some of the audience about maybe balancing some of those. But it is fantastic to have you here today. And I know when your appointment came in 2019, you know, it was at a critical point. Um, and the reform agenda has been a strong one. Catherine, first of all, yes, let me just give you a bit of a background as to what I want to talk to you about. Um, I thought you'd be interested in just what's the transformation piece that uh, we're looking into, because I think that's a terribly important for, uh, issue for taxpayers to make sure that the way we're going to leave this in the future is that uh, we're going to get much better value for money out of the regulator going forward. But uh, we're going to transform the industry as we, as we do that. So. Uh, I think anybody who feels that uh, it was one or two buildings that just simply were the reason why this reform program was required really didn't understand just the state of the industry. Um, there's a lot of projects out there that are being built that uh, just simply aren't up to scratch. Um, I'm really pleased to see Bill Berger in the room because um, you may know that I called them out last Friday night to Property Council and uh, along with a couple of their uh, other colleagues and I think the conversation now needs to move from just simply being more news about the bad or the risky players to actually start saying, but here are the benchmark players. And so I think the way to actually lift the whole of the standard of this industry is actually point to best practice players and say, well, if you want to be good and you want to have a brand in the future, then here are the sorts of exa example organisations that you should go and have a good look at because they do good stuff for a very good reason. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it's yeah, it's fantastic to have them here. Yeah. So it, it is, yeah. I think you're right. Once you start to shine a light on a particular industry and can reform it, you know, there's some great things. You know, right here, right now, the government's got an appetite for reform. So hopefully that can help you. Well, there is a solid appetite right across the government and the cross benches. So mm. one of the really pleasing things was that the legislation that I'll touch on briefly, when it passed the parliament this year, that it actually had the unanimous endorsement of not only the government, but also all of the crossbenchers. So I think we got to a place where people realised that there needed to be uh, leadership to, for change mm. and that leadership had to be empowered. So I'm also very privileged that um, I've been given the powers to lead that change. So we do have very, very significant powers. Mm. So let me just uh, briefly touch on, I've just uh, set up a, a, a quick agenda and I don't want to, so if we could just put the first slide up. Um, I don't want to bore you with a PowerPoint because I think we're all done to death on that, but, but simply why construct New South Wales? Well, we want to establish the appropriate regulatory settings for moving forward. So if you move to the next slide, why, New, why construct New South Wales? Um, and we're going to share this pack with you afterwards. So if I sort of randomly sort of drift off the reservation, uh, that's okay because we can correct that at the end because everybody can have a copy of the pack. But um, so look, we want to raise industry standards. We want to actually come up with a really viable uh, regulatory framework for the future, but really to have a look and see 
where are the touch points that industry can change as part of the transformation because all the heavy lifting can't be done by government. So I think all of the conversations that we've had with industry to this point have moved from when I first came in the job uh, in, 19, in 2019 was that there were 30 or 40 interest groups sitting around the table and all of them had a view of the industry through their lens and that was always that the problem was over there and no, none of them really imagined that they were part of the problem. So I think we've gone from that conversation back in late 2019 to any conversation with any of the working groups today where everybody recognises they've all got a finger in the pie. So I think that's a huge breakthrough because now we can start doing really useful stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So look, just um, the, the, the next slide just simply points to the fact that there are two key pivots that have occurred uh, as we've gone into standing up this legislation. The first is that we're, we've shifted the focus from individual players to groups of players. Uh, it's a bit like the old regulatory focus was that we just looked at the winger or the front rower and basically ran the game by looking at one of them. Mm. And then when the field came off the field, we'd say to the winger, you didn't have a very good game, not your team didn't have a very good game. So we've really focused the shift now to a framework that says, let's look at the players. So the developer, the builder, the certifier, and then we'll add to that the designers and the manufacturers because this industry is no longer performed in a single place. Almost 40% of buildings today come from places outside the New South Wales jurisdiction. So we've got a, a modern regulator has to be globally facing or at least multi-jurisdictionally facing because simply thinking that everything happens in one jurisdiction is, is the last century, not this century. So it's very, very different. So we're looking at teams of players and we're going to be having very sophisticated capability to work out who are the most trustworthy and who are less trustworthy because our focus is making trustworthy buildings. So in the past we've always just simply dominated the conversation about oh that's a bad building, that's a bad building, but what we really want to do is to move the conversation to say the industry aspiration is to produce trustworthy buildings and what we want to do is to point out trustworthy buildings because these are the things that the people who are perhaps not doing as good a job as they might um, will say well give us some signposts show us what you think is is uh, trustworthy and uh, and look I'll use an example um, Meriton is a is an organization I've also called out as being making trustworthy buildings they really do make very good buildings these days but 20 years ago I think even Harry would say that he did some reasonably patchy jobs and, um, and I've joked with him about that. So look, there are people coming and saying, oh, we want to be the next Meriton. How do we go on that journey? We know we're a bit shabby right now, but how do we get to that? So that's the change in the conversation now as well. How do we get to nice. a trustworthy player status? Because that's really what the main game is. So the second part of that slide is just simply a pivot as well to say that not only are we focusing on the, the teams of players, but we're also focusing on the sum of all of the parts of the building. So that in fact, you no longer just focus on the membrane or the glass or some other part of the building. We're saying, no, consumers buy a whole building. They don't buy bits of a building. And they don't like paying lawyers huge amounts of money down the track to argue over whether the membrane was the right membrane and whether the tiles were the right tiles. They just like to have a whole building. So the whole focus that we've now shifted to is how do we point to making whole trustworthy buildings? And so again, I won't bore the, this meeting with that conversation, but we are building some very, very powerful capabilities to in fact achieve that outcome. So on the next slide, we, I'll just simply touch on uh, the new legislation. This slide just simply gives you a link but most of you will be familiar with uh, the, the fact that there's the, um, the new legislation started on the 1st of September, which is the uh, Residential Apartment Buildings uh, and Compliance and Enforcement Powers Act, long name, better known as the RAB Act. Um, and that just gives me extraordinary powers to start from the 1st of September this year mm -hmm. to really signal and deliver changes. Now, we want to use that capability to show people why they're suboptimal, why their product is not as good as it should be, 
and to try and work with people over the final stages of their project to bring it to a point where the consumer will be delighted with it as opposed to disappointed. So we've used a, a, a point in that transaction where when in New South Wales you get an occupation certificate, it allows a developer to give a notice to a, a purchaser that it's time to shift from being a depositor to an owner. So we think that's the most effective place for me as an advocate for consumers to say, well, before you move them from being a depositor to an owner, how about I have a look and see whether it's up to it? And so that's what really the RAB Act allows us to do. But it gives us extraordinary powers to call in documents, to open up work, instruct for work to be redone, and in a very, very few cases, to simply hold up the issuance of an occupation certificate. But we'll probably have to do that along the way, just to make sure everybody understands that is the last resort, but it is a resort. But more importantly, the Design and Building Practitioners Act, which was approved at the same time as the RAB Act, um, really sets the future for New South Wales making of buildings. We're starting with class two, which is multi-unit residential, and the ministers indicated that that could apply to other asset classes in, the, in a few years from now. So um, we'll start with class two buildings. But what it, the fundamental pieces of that is, it's introduced a duty of care for the players. So you, you've now got a clear duty of care, whether you're a designer or whether you're a builder. And designers have to declare designs. Mm. So they'll have to have an accreditation that they can do the work that they're professing they're doing and then declare it. Again, a lot of back of house capability that we're putting in to make sure that really, really happens. And then for builders at the end of the day to say, I built the building in accordance with those declared designs and the building code of Australia, and I know I'm personally responsible for that declaration. Now these are two headland pieces and they don't exist in any other state. Yeah. So what, what that means is that as this, as this transformation comes in and it's already started, is that actually New South Wales will become the best place to buy an apartment in Australia off the plant. Treasurer's going to like that one. Okay, so there's absolutely no doubt about it in yeah. my mind because, yeah. you know, this has been three years in the making. It didn't start when I came on board. Yeah. So this is a, 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 a journey that the government was predisposed to go on. And the goal here is to make New South Wales the leading state in Australia that exhibits all of these qualities. I don't see anybody starting that journey. And even if they did decide to do it today, I reckon it would take them at least two to three years mm. to get their boat in the water. So we've got a boat in the water and 1st of July next year, the Design and Building Practitioners Act comes into play. And for developers, I know there are some developers on this uh, or clients on this um, meeting today, is that you really do need to think about what it means because you won't be able to engage designers to do a short script design. You'll actually have to design, engage them to do the design. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so look, I'm not going to bore you on that. Yeah. Uh, new resources. Um, first uh, question that I got hit up with when I came on board is, well, Commissioner, um, you, you might have a magic cape, but you can't be everywhere. So when are you going to get some new resources? The objective was to uh, see if there could be pressure to create a, uh, a building commission. Um, mm -hmm. And the suggestion was that I'd need 100 people to do that. Uh, look, I've done a lot of uh, uh, company and project workouts over the years. And I've never ever walked in the front door with more than just me. I've normally relieved the CEO of his job and said, I'll sit there and call everybody in and say, guys, this is what it's going to look like in a year from now. Who wants to come on the journey? Now, obviously, we need a few more resources than that. So I've got a very small transformation team in the Office of Building Commissioner, about 15 people. But we're bringing on 60 new boots on the ground and we're putting them where they're going to make a difference. Yeah. We're going to put them in the regulator's office. And so the first 15 are on, the next 10 are currently being interviewed. And I can tell you, we've, we've attracted some amazing talent to help us roll this out. So we're going to have boots on the ground and my office will lead the transformation, both of the industry piece and also the regulatory piece. So very yeah. big pieces of work yeah. and it's started. We're out in the field right here, right now. So I just want to give you a quick indication of what the regulator might look like going forward. And what, what we found is that the, the regulator in the past, um, we think 
they've played, well, we know they've played the game too far after the game's finished. So when we go back to those run on players, it's a bit like the winger ran out, played a bad game, went back, had a shower, went home, sat down, watched the replay of the game, had a beer, and finally one of our people would turn up and go, I don't think you played real well. Well, you know, you can't change the game if that's when you're telling the winger. Yep. The game's over. Yep. So what we reckon we need to do is to make sure that the run on team understands what the goal is. The goal is a trustworthy building. So we're looking to sort of rate teams to say, well, how predictable are you mm. at putting the ball through the post, which is the trustworthy building? Yep. Okay, so we've got the regulators starting to think about what they'll look like. They'll certainly be an organisation that is uh, really digitally powerful. I mean, really, the, the, uh, the, the data that's available to a regulator these days is amazing. And so we have the ability as well to assemble that data in ways that have never been imagined before. So in the next slide, just simply, that's the transformation waiting. So in the next slide that you'll see from here shows just simply the current state of the regulator. You'll see that a building typically takes four years to make. It takes about six years to unravel if it's going to unravel. Yep. You can see that in the past, all of our efforts been at, after it's unraveled. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in the future, what we want to do is to get ahead of that game and so that's, the, that's just a simple explanation that all the resources that what we said were currently sitting at the back of the bus, we want them to move to the front of the bus and drive the bus from the front, not just simply commentate it on it from the back. So that is the big piece that's changing mm. in the regulator and we will deliver a smarter, more able regulator. Now, the next slide just simply said, this final two slides in this presentation, I believe, yes, there is, um, just simply that you should never try and do anything unless you can measure it. If you, mm -hmm. can't, if you can't say green ball, top right hand pocket, if you're just going to hit the ball and hope, then you're, you're a dud. But if you can say, I'm going to put the green ball in the top right hand pocket every time, mm -hmm. then you look as though you've got a bit of talent. So what we're doing is developing a set of dashboards that are really facing into the key weaknesses of this industry. So we're looking to sort of measure what's the health of structures being built, red, green, amber. Mm -hmm. What are the state of waterproofing in buildings? Health checks, same as that. State of fire installations. State of the building envelope, the enclosure of the buildings. The acoustics in the buildings and the critical services of the buildings. So we're building a set of dashboards that actually look into how the industry is performing those elements of a building. And the important thing to do about that is to note is that we're focusing on what's known as the common property of buildings as opposed to the individual lot. So we're less interested in a scratch on a bench top mm. or a smudge on the paint on the wall. That's something that's easy to sort out. Mm. What's more difficult is that if the waterproofing in all the bathrooms is a problem right throughout the building, that's a nightmare. Yes. Okay, so what we're, what we're trying to do is to unpack this debate that was on the table when I came in which sort of says, oh, 85% of buildings have got defects. Yes, that's fascinating information, but they never unpacked the scratch on the bench top or the smudge on the wall out of that. Yep. What we don't know is exactly how many buildings have problems with bathrooms or wet areas and their structure and their fire systems. So we're, we're going to unpack that and publicly account to the industry and to government as to how we're travelling through improving those elements. So that's a dashboard that we're using for the transition period. Mm -hmm. And the second dashboard, which really is the final piece that I wanted to share with you, and that is that traditionally, um, owners' corporations have been induced to lawyer up too early. Um, it's the constant problem I find is that rather than owners' corporations going to the Office of Fair Trading and saying, we've got defects in our building, mm -hmm. they skip that step and they go straight to a lawyer. Now, a lawyer will immediately put his arms around that. So I invariably get a letter from a lawyer saying, oh, no need to go there, Commissioner, I'm handling that. Hmm. And I say, well, that's fantastic. So why don't you come in and talk to me about what does it look like when you win? If you win after spending millions of these people's money, what's it look like? Well, I can't tell you. It's a big process to go through before we know that answer. Well, I'm saying, well, you can't tell me what you're going to achieve for consumers. And that is a real problem because I'm seeing some really horrible exhibits 
where both sides of any dispute are able to go and find experts. Some of these experts would argue the undefensible. Absolutely argue that. It's indefensible what some of them will support. So we are really looking for a message to say to consumers and owners of body corporates and their executives to say, go first to the Office of Fair Trading, make a complaint. And if you're not satisfied with that, then that will filter up to me and I'm going to look at the outliers to say, well, of the, the Office of Fair Trading typically fixes about 70% of matters. Okay, so in that 30% that's left, mm -hmm. there's a place for me to get the attention of the people that perhaps have taken their eye off the ball, mm. which is a trustworthy building. Yeah. So what we've done is we're actually doing a new set of dashboards that will just, this is a public confidence dashboard. So what we're looking to do now is to map the increasing number of matters that are first referred to the Office of Fair Trading. Mm. And then you'll see on that diagram, the red line is actually tracking a reducing number of matters that go to NCAT. So this is not a good story for lawyers. Um, because this says that you probably have to take your kids out of private schools yeah, yeah, and get back to the real world or, or go to Queensland or Victoria where they've still got rich litigation going on. And then we also want to reduce the number of matters are going to the court. So we've, mm. you know, I'm told that on some, some occasions um, strata-related strata litigation takes up half of the list in the support, Supreme Court. Now that's cost the community a huge amount of money just to provide the justice framework, yeah. let alone the cost of getting the consumers into that space. So we want to drive first references up to the Office of Fair Trading. Mm -hmm. We want to make the Office of Fair Trading far more accountable for their performance, measurably, publicly reportable. And we also want to drive down the number of matters going to NCAT and the number of matters going to the Supreme Court that would be an exhibit of this industry has been transformed. It is kind of interesting because we did have the um, Attorney General with us uh, for a conversation like this not long ago. And, you know, there's, you know, there's long waiting lists in those courts. So anything that reforms that, you know, there's exponential savings to the taxpayer as a result. Well, it is. And, you know, I've got a matter at the moment where a consumer that got pushed away from the Office of Fair Trading, I think wrongly, but we'll mm -hmm. see. I've currently got that being reviewed, but they went off to NCAT and the other side's lawyers, the, the, the defendant, in this case it was a builder, um, managed to get three experts, engineers, to mm. testify that a certain set of facts didn't exist when in fact they did. Um, we've got a situation where in NCAT two days of recorded hearings were lost. And so they weren't able to be relied on in the final judgment. The consumer lost. They should never have lost. They had costs awarded against them. So they'd spent $140,000 personally, and they had $240,000 awarded against them. Now, this is an absolutely unacceptable situation. Yeah. And they're the sorts of things I'm looking to make exhibits of yeah. and then to change the game. And it's a big cultural change in every aspect of the industry, you know, whether you're saying it's, you know, the, the point here, the lawyers are going to have to start rethinking, but just as much as the builders and the designers. So um, it's a massive transformation. And all those touch points that you're saying is they're going to take time. Is there, is there a particular pain point in that cultural change or, or are people starting to say, I get it now? Maybe, maybe it might be your sporting analogies. I'm loving those. <laughs> They're really good as an ex sports person. So it's like, but it does help to keep it, you know, keep well, it real. There are some pain points. Um, so as I move early in what I'm doing, mm. um, people probably don't realise that if I have a choice to go that way because of a consumer or that way because of someone else, I'll always go the consumer's way. So that's where I'm going to be. So should, no one should be in doubt it'll be consumers first in this transformation because it's been the industry defending itself for far too long. Mm. Okay, so um, I might foot fault, so I might actually be serving the ball and mm -hmm. just put my foot over the line. Well, I did that a few weeks ago and first thing, I got a letter from a lawyer who's typically a defendant of these consumers who suddenly swapped, a, he's, a, he's a hare that now runs with the foxes oh. and writing me a letter and say, Commissioner, you've overstepped and I'm gonna sue you and I'm really upset. And my response to him is this. How about I set up a table down in the foyer of the McKell building mm -hmm. and you and I can have a chat and we'll have the media in while we have a chat 
and we'll let the public opinion resolve whether you think I foot folded or not. So they'd probably be booing, right? So we're going to have a few pinch points like that. Um, yep. uh, we're getting close to uh, unfortunately having to issue the first uh, uh, stop on some work that's being done. Uh, we found a very, very unsafe and unsatisfactory situation out there. So we're probably going to issue, well, we will, we will issue a prohibition order very shortly. Mm. Um, we've got a process to go through, but we found just something that is uh, an OC that's so close that if this turned into an occupation certificate with this matter unresolved, you can't undo an occupation certificate. So we're, we're gonna step in there, right? Yeah. So there'll be some pain points there. Yeah. But look, I think what we're doing is that we'll see many, many more people saying, oh, I've got it now. Okay, that's what, that's what we've got to do. And it doesn't cost any more to do it right. Mm. That's the thing that really is annoying. Mm. It costs no more to do it right. Yeah, it's interesting. And so <clears throat> you mentioned about the OC certificate. That's coming out of your audit work, is that right? Because yes. that's underway. So, yes. maybe, so where's that going? And it's, yeah, and, and how's it going? Well, the legislation required that um, every, every developer who's got a project that's within six months of completion mm -hmm. has to give me a notice on the first, two, within two weeks of the 1st of September. Uh, so we've had uh, 430, so everybody understands we're serious. Mm -hmm. I think you'll probably find there might be less than 20 who thought it was clever not to notify, well, there's fines for that, so they'll, they'll, we'll deal with that in due course. But 430, it might be more than that today, but it sort of went up really quickly. Um, and so we now can see a pattern of how many buildings are going to achieve an occupation certificate over the next six months. Some, of course, have only got a very small amount of time to run because start of legislation, anticipated date of occupation certificate could be two weeks, a month or six. So we've had to pick on which ones of those do we want to have a serious look at. Mm -hmm. We've got a pretty good line of sight to which ones we should have a look at. Mm -hmm. But we also mix the sample up with uh, random selections. Okay. Okay. Because it's, the industry wanted to know, don't just pick on one end of the market that you think are all the bad guys. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you have a look at what's happening elsewhere to make sure that you've got your line of sight right. So. Um, we're doing both. We're picking. Uh, we're sort of picking those that we think at the fringe, yeah. um, and we're picking a sample of those that we think ought to be all right. Because it is one of those things, and maybe um, to use sort of sporting analogy, but a financial services one where you've got ASIC, and again, as a, a regulator, you know, when do they investigate, and and do they target, and are you going to follow an approach? They might go, well, it's a certain aspect of the industry we're going to target, in, and really sort of do a deeper dive, um, and then there comes you kind of touched it on it before is. Are we going to showcase the bad guys or the good guys or a combination of the two? Because how do you lift that bar? Look, um, I, I don't think it's a, a, a good strategy to call out the bad players all the time. I mean, it's a bit like if you've got a child growing up. I remember at some stage my mother used to say to me, David, you are so dumb, you're going to be nothing other than a garbage man. And if, if, you, hear, oh. if you hear that, if you, no, but if you hear that all your life, you know, in a way, you get conditioned to that. And here yeah, I am, yeah. here I am now at this stage of my life and I'm okay. putting out the garbage. So, <laughs> so she was probably right. Yeah, but, yeah. but seriously, I think if we can, if we can show the, show the case the good stuff, yeah. then that is going to be the way I would like to focus. Yeah. But we will have to use our enforcement powers mm. modestly, mm. but impactively, mm. okay? But we're also got to look at other people who are in this with us. So ATSIC, for example, have very, very important powers mm. as a regulator. Yep. So too many matters die as soon as you've come up by paying the last of the creditors. Mm. And the fact that really unsatisfactory behaviour of directors occurred to get it there. Mm. Now, some companies go broke because of circumstances beyond their control, but some companies actually have that as a business model. Yeah. They're called phoenixes. Yep. Now, I think ATSIC has got a lot more to do in this space. Mm, so I've picked a matter yeah. and I'm in the process now of assembling it such that there's an unavoidable challenge to ATSIC to say, okay, what are you going to do about this one? Yeah, yeah. And I'm not going to let it go. Fair enough. Use, use all those levers you can. Yeah, totally. but you see what you can do. It's because this is almost, and you've used the term even when we were doing the presentation, a modern regulator, you know, and it's interesting because it, uh, it, uh, you know, maybe 
What are some of the things that would really characterise that modern regulator? You've touched on pieces, but you know, is there you know, those three things or three critical things that a modern regulator would do as opposed to a, I don't know, an unmodern, I'm, I'll, I'll create words for you. Well, a, a relic of the last a century. relic of the last century. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, um, it's, it's funny that today I just happen to be going to a meeting this afternoon, which is the first of the business transformation meetings with the regulator. Mm. So we've set ourselves a goal that says, well, the legislation requires that by March 2022, that I go back to the parliament yeah. with a business plan and business case to say, this is what the future regulator will look like. Mm. So it struck me that when I came in, how we continue to regulate around the way that the industry has always operated. So for example, much more stuff these days is coming from offsite. Mm. So we've got bathroom pods, for example, being manufactured in Victoria or coming from overseas. And we're not even looking at those. They just go eh, eh, and we don't look at them. Um, we, we haven't really used data all that well. So I think we also then need to say, well, in, within five years from now, what will a building be different to what it's like today? Well, I believe we're on a very rapid journey to buildings becoming smarter. I think buildings are dumb. At the moment, you put a panel on a wall and it doesn't come with any intelligence. But within two or three years, we're going to have a panel go onto a building wall that's got a piece of uh, a chip in it that's able to tell whether it's too hot, too cold, it's leaking or whatever. So progressively, the Internet of Things is going to see buildings become smart. Yep. So I don't think we've anticipated what a smart building is. And if you start to look at, you know, what's the nearest thing to a smart thing, you'd say, well, it may be a robot. And so what are the global trends to looking at how do you regulate a robot? Well, the international practice has now started to say, well, the first rule about robots is that they don't hurt humans. So maybe that's a pretty good starting point for a building is to say, well, a modern building should not hurt humans. That's a good place to start. Okay. <laughs> you might get the trust then. <laughs> See what we go. It's fantastic. Well, first of all, let me say that um, I have taken some liberties since I visited your job uh, because people have said, where do I go to see stuff that should be normal. And one of the things that I noticed on your job was um, the use of QR codes in the apartments. Now, um, I had not seen this before. I suspect, I suspect there's others, probably mm. dozens of others that have this. But one of the things that if you buy a project in the roads development is that you'd be able to put your phone over a QR code at the doorway and it'll produce the floor plans for the apartment and a manual and all of the details that are relevant okay. to that apartment. Now, why wouldn't a consumer 20 years into this century yeah. um, not have that? And then they've integrated uh, the consumer complaints process into the, uh, the concierge uh, uh, panel in, in the apartment. So you can actually lodge a, a defect complaint directly from that panel. And so they're running a customer desk to actually deal directly with that intel. I reckon that within five years, it'll be unlikely that there'll be an apartment developer in New South Wales at least that doesn't have a QR code on their door frame showing their consumer what they've got. So th that, that's important. And I think if I could you know, get people like Mervac and Helm and those sorts of people who really have busted themselves to help with this effort mm -hmm. um, to, to just simply open their doors and, and, and not see what they're doing as protectable IP, mm -hmm. to see this as shareable IP because I reckon that people who need to protect their IP probably only do so because they're worried they'll never have another good idea. I am entirely accepting of the legitimacy of the design and construct form of project delivery. I do believe, however, that DNC is a capability that should be in the hands of mature businesses, not immature businesses. So if you're a startup, then you've got enough things going on your mind to worry about becoming also the designer. So I subscribe to a view that says in the first five years of a company, when you've got your trainer wheels on, mm -hmm. you're still getting your balance sheet sorted out, you're still trying to attract a stable workforce, and you're trying to get a few jobs with a bit of profit in it, you'd be far better off doing a build-only contract than a design and construct. Because quite often, 
those startup players are the ones that some developers lean on to say, oh, I'll give you a design and construct contract, and it's only I've only given you 80% of the design, you make up the rest. Well, they're the last people you want making it up. What you need is organisations that have been around seven, ten years and more who have institutionalised the fact that we do bathrooms around here this way, we do balconies around here this way. I mean, you go to Mervac, mm. uh, an architect comes in and says, look, we'll buy the design off you, but that's the way our bathrooms go together, that's the way our balconies go together, and don't mess with that. Look, Peter, it's a complex uh, question and um, I'm not going to try and respond to your specific uh, example because um, you'd need to know a lot more about it. But we've got a lot of product on buildings that should never have been there. We've got lots of product on buildings that have relied on a factory, ex-factory testing certificate and haven't really then followed the changes to that materials as it's gone onto the job site. So we're seeing lots of materials that might have had a cert mark on them at one stage, but that's not a, worth a postage stamp today because it's been bent and cut and hacked and all sorts of things done to it, so it's no longer an example of its former self. I, I'm running into this situation with other materials, so it's probably best to move away from that, and we might be saying, let's talk about, um, let's talk about uh, electrical wiring that doesn't meet Australian standards. Well, I got confronted with a builder this week who said, well, isn't this a border issue? Shouldn't this be stopped at the border? And my view of it is, look, there's enough stuff coming through the border without trying to make the government responsible for everything at the border. Did you order it and did you pay for it? Because if you ordered it and you paid for it, then I think it's your problem. So I'm not really interested in the border problem I'm interested in the fact that the core transaction is that you sold this apartment to this purchaser who is unsophisticated, who thought that you were going to do the right thing for them and that they had a fit for purpose building. So look, Peter, I empathise with your problem um, and I don't think there's an easy solution. Um, I actually have just come from the first or inaugural meeting of the uh, a, a, a pro cladding uh, products advisory working group that is now reporting to me um, and you would have heard that that was announced in the last week and Mark or a couple of weeks and Mark Hoffman is chairing that. Um, I'll have a much more intelligent answer to your question uh, in the not too distant future and hopefully we'll provide some guidance as to whether the industry leads this response to this problem or government helps lead this thing. We'll have more clarity on that in the next short while so I'm, I'm going to do the appropriate thing and duck the rest of the question for now. But I won't duck it forever, I promise you. I've had a number of the good developers come in and say, David, we get overbid by these bad players at an auction for a site. They're prepared to pay 20% more for the site because they can rip 20% of the cost of the building out. Yeah. So we lose a perfectly good site that's then going to receive a perfectly unacceptable building. Now these are the people that Peter competes against. Mm. What I've got to really do is to, is to say, Peter, my goal is to level up the playing field so the people that do the right thing are not undermined by people who are prepared to do the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's a, it's a good uh, segue into digital. Uh, you'll need a digital capability to lodge declared designs into the e-planning portal. Uh, one of the challenges though that we are dealing with is that only the top 5% of the players of the industry work in a BIM space and I think that over-prescribing the use of BIM too far down into this industry would be probably unviable and maybe even undesirable. We do need to understand what the digital part of the industry is going to be mm -hmm. because buildings are going to have a digital twin yep. and, and the people who make them will have a digital twin so that's one of the things that they'll realise as we stand up the new licensing platform is that whenever they go and lodge a drawing now on the e-planning platform mm. from the 1st of July next year, they'll have to go off to the licensing platform, identify themselves and get a one-time digital chop and use that to lodge the drawings. So not only will buildings have a digital twin, 
the people who draw, design them and build them will have digital twins. We are 20 years into this century. It's about time we started to get on the page. I do want to thank you, David, for coming. Um, sounds like you are kicking goals. It, it does take time. And I think there's uh, the agenda there is, as I said, strong, it's robust. You've got industry players here who are you know, pretty supportive. Um, so you, you're definitely doing something right. Uh, so thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us today. And, and as I said, we'll share the presentation from David. We'll share the video with you. And, um, and I'm sure that you'll hear a lot more from David in the future. Yeah.